hello. This is Brexit Map Man. It's the 8th of May, 2020. It's VE Day, the day that we celebrate victory uh, over Nazi Germany, over Hitler uh, in 1945. But I'm not celebrating today. I'm not celebrating because I don't see dancing on the streets. I don't see overflowing happiness. I don't see joy because our situation in fact is the opposite. Our situation is that we are prisoners. We are prisoners in our own homes. If you go out on the street, uh, you may be stopped by the police and told to get off the street. You may be pursuing your natural activity and be told that you can't do that. And we now have laws in this country that have been passed that you would not get unless you were in a state of absolute war, unless there were bombs raining down upon us. We have laws that have been passed which give the state absolute power. In fact, we are now living under what we tried, what we fought to, to get out of. We, we left the European Union. We voted to leave the European Union because we didn't want to be part of a tyrannical uh, uh, United States of Europe. But we now find ourselves in, it doesn't, we don't, it doesn't have to be the EU. We now find ourselves living basically in tyranny. Okay, we don't have, you know, we don't have, uh, we're not being shot in the streets at this point in time. But uh, I heard that today Tommy Robinson tried to put a flag, a Union Jack, outside his house and the police came around and told him to stop. I I'm not sure if that's true, but that's what I heard. And I heard that other people were having the same, that, that you can't put up the Union Jack outside your house. The authorities will come and stop you on VE Day. So where are we now? Where actually are we? We, in my point of view, looks like we actually lost the war. So I want to share with you where I believe we are or where I know we are. And people are still scratching their heads. They're saying, what's going on? Is a virus, is it a virus? Isn't it a virus? Is it 5G? Is it not 5G? Uh, or, you know, did it, and are you, if you're still wondering what's going on after six weeks of sitting in your home with, uh, with your computer and you're still trying to figure it out, well, you're behind the curve. Uh, because many of, I know that, of course, many of you have figured, pretty much figured out what's happened. And I'm, I can't go into everything because we are, we are experiencing a, uh, basically a plot of, of proportions that are almost impossible to, to conceive. And I know that many people are feeling completely crushed. And we are basically in that position. So how do we, uh, how do, how do we uh, deal with that? Well, certainly tomorrow people will be uh, expressing their displeasure, that's for sure, uh, in Hyde Park as far as I know. And, uh, and we, I will be doing action as well because our rights have been taken away, our natural rights that were given to us by God. And I'm now going to show you exactly what's happened. Uh, please watch this.
，包括现在在南美流行的寨卡病毒，如果用基因编辑技术对这些病毒细菌加以改造的话，那么就可以生产出传播性更广，而且致命性更强的超级病毒和超级细菌。那么这样的超级病毒和超级细菌，它的杀伤能力，那真是可以和原子弹、氢弹，可以和化学武器相媲美。嗯，所以说这个危险还是很大。但是刚才说到是潜在武器之一，那么从技术到基因武器，它都会面临哪些难点？它这里头不光是要生产出这种超级病毒或者超级细菌，你真正要大规模使用的话，你首先要解决一个伤敌而不伤己的问题。更可怕的是，它可以针对某一种种族的特征、基因特征，专门研制定向的这样的某一族群的这个杀伤的。对，因为我们每个族群的。基因都有自己各自的特征。当然，最可怕的是，这种技术流到了疯子或者说是极端恐怖组织手里，他们可能甚至不管能不能伤己，只要能给人类造成危害、造成恐怖，就会大规模使用。Now the question of、uh, how how the how the virus was developed. Uh, who developed it、uh, is very complicated. In, in fact,、um, basically, it came from America, and the Chinese got it. And、uh, how it got there is a is a bit of a complex process. But at the end of the day, what happened was that in 2015,、uh, Obama closed down. The、uh, America's bioweapons program, and、uh, somehow this particular virus、uh, ended, wended its way to China. Now, if you want to find out more about that, there are two people that you have to watch, and then you will understand all about that. I'm not going to go into that because it's complicated. But the first one, the first person you need to to study is Judy Mikovits. If, uh, and that is spelled Judy J U D I, and then M I K O V I T S. Find find videos of her on YouTube.、Um, you find it also、uh, a video of of her on Petrie Link Twins UK.、Uh, if it's still up, because they keep taking them down, because what she has to say is so explosive, the establishment doesn't want you to know about it. And、uh, the other person to go and watch the videos of is George Webb. Now、uh, you'll find him on YouTube, and you'll also find him on Patreon. And what what he has to say will make your hair fall out. But what I'm here to share with you is something completely different to show you the background of what's happening. And、uh, the video that you've just seen. Is about the Chinese and their strategy、uh, towards America, and I have here a speech, and I'm going to read you this speech. This speech is from Mr. Chi. Now my my pronunciation, my Chinese is no good. Mr. Chi Haoxian, and he was the Minister of Defence. Uh, an establishment、uh, communist party leader,、uh, and this speech was made in April on April the twenty third in two thousand and five. It's called "The War Is Not Far From Us," and is the midwife of the Chinese century. And there is the clue to everything you need to know: the concept of the Chinese century. And、uh, you will understand after I've read this speech. It's a bit long, but it will. This will make you <laughs> make you sit up. I'm telling you, it's it's scary stuff. So here we go. So here's a picture of Mr. Chi Haoxian. He is the man that you that uh, get, that uh, gave this speech to.、Um, We're not sure exactly because somehow it leaked. No one really knows. In fact, it hasn't actually been confirmed that it 
actually is. But if you read this, if you go through it, you know that this, you know that this is real. And uh, it was given to, I, I think, uh, uh, some like Chinese Communist Party youth elite, or, or I don't know exactly. But uh, anyway, listen to this, that this gentleman, what he has in store for us, and uh, <clears throat> take some sleeping pills tonight. Comrades, I'm very excited today because the large scale online survey that was done for us showed that our next generation is quite promising and our party's cause will be carried on. In answering the question, will you shoot at women, children and prisoners of war, more than 80% of the respondents answered in the affirmative, exceeding by far our expectations. The central issue of this survey appears to be whether one should shoot at women, children and prisoners of war, but its real significance goes far beyond that. Ostensibly, our intention is mainly to figure out what the Chinese people attitude is to war. If these future soldiers do not hesitate to kill even non-combatants, they'll naturally be doubly ready and ruthless in killing combatants. Therefore, the responses to the survey questions may reflect the general attitude people have to war. Actually, however, this is not our genuine intention. The purpose of the CCP, uh, <coughs> Chinese Communist Party, committee in conducting this survey is to probe people's minds. We want to know if China's global development will necessitate massive deaths in enemy countries. Will our people endorse that scenario? Will they be for or against it? The fact is, our development refers to the great revitalization of the Chinese nation, which of course is not limited to the land we have now, but also includes the whole world. Why do we put it this way? As everybody knows, according to the views propagated by the Western scholars, humanity as a whole originated from one single mother in Africa. Therefore, no race can claim superiority. However, according to the research conducted by most Chinese scholars, the Chinese are different from other races on earth. We did not originate in Africa. Instead, we originated independently in the land of China. We used to say Chinese civilization has had a history of 5,000 years. But now we can assert that we are the product of cultural roots of more than a million years. Civilization and progress of more than 10,000 years. An ancient nation of 5,000 years and a single Chinese entity of 2,000 years. This is the Chinese nation that calls itself descendants of Yan and Huang. Those are names, Huang, Yan and Huang, that means tribes, you know, it's like Smith and Jones, basically. The Chinese nation that we are so proud of. Got that? They're not, they're an independently evolved race, not, not part of the rest of humanity. They're very, very, very special. 
Hitler's Germany had once bragged that the German race was the most superior race on earth. But the fact is, our nation is far superior to the Germans. During our long history, our people have disseminated throughout the, throughout the Americas and the, long, and the regions along the Pacific Rim. And they became Indians in the Americas and the East Asian ethnic groups in the South Pacific. And of course he's right. I mean, uh, the, the, um, the Native Americans that were there when the Europeans arrived originated from the, from that, from the Chinese con continent. Actually not what we call China today, but actually Manchuria, which is the kind of east part of China, below Mongolia and above Korea. So, so he's right, the, the, the American Indians did originate from, from, the, from that continent and they were there before the Europeans arrived. Yes, they were. So this is his point. He's making a claim. He's making a claim. We were there first and so we're going to be there last. That's what his claim is. Just like Hitler wanted to reclaim the lands of the Germanic people. We all know that on account of our national superiority during the thriving and prosperous Tang dynasty, our civilization was at the peak of the world. We were the center of the world's civilization and no other civilization in the world was comparable to ours. Later on, because of our complacency, narrow-mindedness and the self-enclosure of our own country, we were surpassed by the Western civilization and the center of the world shifted to the West. In reviewing history, one may ask, Will the center of the world civilization shift back to China? Therefore, if we refer to the 19th century as the British century and the 20th century as the American century, then the 21st century will be the Chinese century. To understand conscientiously conscientiously this historical law and to be prepared to greet the advent of the Chinese century is the historical mission of our party. As we all know at the end of the last century we built the altar to the Chinese century in Beijing and you can see a picture of that altar here. I got it for you. This is the building uh, at night and in the day. It's a massive, huge thing uh, near the military museum, of course, in Beijing. Uh, and uh, it's, it looks great at night, all lit up, but in the day it's just a concrete thing. But I mean, you can see what, they're, what it's all about here. It's, it's a massive statement. Uh, <clears throat> so we built the altar to the Chinese century at Beijing at the very moment of the arrival of the new millennium, you know, in, 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 at the midnight of 1999 and 2000 came in as we, we all marked that, that time, the, the new millennium, the collective leadership of the party central committee gathered there for a rally, upholding the torches of Zhu Kaodian to pledge themselves to get re ready to greet the, the arrival of the Chinese century. So who, what is Zhu Kaodian? I can't pronounce it. Zhu Kaodian is what they call Peking man. And you can see in the picture here, this big massive statue of Peking man, as they call it, was 
was was the the, the skeletons, the, the fossils or whatever that were found. They call Peking Man, and and they this is the statue. And school children come there. They bring school children for a pilgrimage. This is your ancestor of the Chinese race. And then they brainwash the children. And, 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 and you are the superior race. And here is your ancestor to say hello to your ancestor. And here he is. There you go. Right? And on that day, they brought torches resembling sem semblance of this Peking man. And they brought it to the monument that they built to, to uh, mark the new Chinese century. This is the beginning point of our, of our taking the world. And this is what they did. It was like a holy ceremony for the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party. Yes. So yes, a solemn ceremony with torches the Central Committee of the Communist Party, the inner core, the chosen, the, the committed, for whom the party is everything. They consider themselves the gods of the new world, the fashioners of the next millennium. And there they were. And the altar, they call it the Chinese century altar, like some kind of religious holy dedication. But it wasn't to the God that we know. Oh no. So, shall we carry on? Mr. Chi Hao Tang's speech to the youth of the Chinese Communist Party. So why were they doing this? Here he explains. We were doing this to follow the historical law and setting the realization of the Chinese century as the goal of our party's endeavors. This is what the, the Communist Party lives for to establish the Chinese century. Later, in our party's 16th National Congress, we established that the national revitalization be our great objective and explicitly specified in our new party constitution that our party is the, is the pioneer of the Chinese people. This isn't about communist ideology. It's much, much more than that. This is about establishing their race as the, as the, as the dominant race on the planet. How should we fight for the realization of the Chinese century? We must borrow the experiences in human history and draw lessons from what has happened to other ethnic groups. Today, I'd like to talk about the lessons of Germany and Japan. Nazi Germany placed much emphasis on the education of the people, especially the younger generation. The Nazi party and government organized and established various propaganda and educational institutions aimed at instilling into the people's minds from elementary schools to colleges the idea that the German people are superior and convincing people that the historical mission of the Aryan people is to become the lords of the earth that rule over the world. Back then the German people were much more united than we are today. Nonetheless, Germany was defeated in utter shame, along with its ally Japan. Why? We reached some conclusions at the study meetings, 
of the Pulit, of the Politburo. Oh yes, the Politburo has study meetings. Ah. In which we were searching for the laws that governed the vicissitudes of the big powers. They're always looking for laws. You see, communism founded on Marxism under, uh, sought to find laws or, or, of economic laws, the, uh, the, the evolutionary laws, and applied them to, to uh, society, to apply them to the, 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 the evolution of history, so that they would uh, establish the, the, the ideal world. Uh, and trying to analyze Germany and Japan's rapid growth. When we decide to revitalize China based on the German model, we must not repeat the mistakes they made. Of course not. Specifically, the following are the fundamental causes for their defeat. First, they had too many enemies all at once, as they did not adhere to the principle of eliminating enemies one at a time. Second, they were too impetuous, lacking the patience and perseverance required for great accomplishments. Third, when the time came for them to be ruthless, they turned out to be too soft. The Nazis were too soft, according to Mr. Chi of the Chinese Communist Party. The Nazis were too soft therefore leaving troubles that resurfaced later on. Of course, if they had not made these mistakes, Asia under Japan's command would have brought into full play the Oriental wisdom, conquered the West, ruled by Germany, and unified the whole world. So if Japan, that's their view, you see, because Japanese are, are Oriental, they're, they're the, basically the same race. So obviously they're superior. If Germany had, had won, Germany would have ruled the West, but uh, eventually the Japanese being superior race would have destroyed the Germans and then ruled the whole world. Yes, because they're superior. So the fundamental reason for the defeats of Germany and Japan is that history did not arrange them to be the lords of the earth. No, for they are, after all, not the most superior race. If we are to make a comparison between Germany and China, Germany is too trivial to be compared. How large is Germany's population? How big is its territory? And how long is its history? We eliminated 8 million nationalist troops in only three years. How many enemies did Germany kill? Of course, when the communists fought against the, the nationalists in China during the revolution, well, they eliminated 8 million of their troops. Can you imagine that? So the Germans were amateurs. The Nazis were amateurs, rank amateurs. They were in power for a transient period of, li of a little more than a dozen years before they perished while we are still energetic after being around for more than 80 years. Well, they're, they're, they're right, the, the Chinese Communist Party still there. This was in, in 2005, so 15 years later, and they still control and dominate China absolutely. Our theory of the shifting center of civilization, i.e. from, you know, the different areas, from, uh, you know, England to, to to America, to, to China, is of, is of course more profound, their theory is more profound than Hitler's theory of the lords of the earth. Our civilization is profound and broad, which has determined that we are so much wiser than they were. Okay, do you understand what we're dealing with? This is how the Chinese communists think. Think about what this man is saying. Do you think they've changed since 2005, 15 years later? The Chinese plan, they have a 100-year plan. 
our Chinese people are wiser than the Germans because fundamentally our race is superior to theirs. As a result, we have a longer history, more people and a larger land area. On this basis, our ancestors left us with the two most essential heritages, which are atheism and great unity. It was Confucius, the founder of our Chinese culture, who gave us these heritages. So they're atheists, even without communism, they're atheists. These two heritages determined that we have a stronger ability to survive than the West. That is why the Chinese race has been able to prosper for so long. We are destined not to be buried by either heaven or earth, no matter how severe the natural, man-made and national disasters, this is our advantage. They're very, very patient, they're very, very determined, they will never be put off. Whatever comes their way, the Chinese will always persevere. They don't give up because they believe, you know, this is how, how Chinese are. What makes us different from Germany is that we are complete atheists. Oh yes, while Germany was primarily a Catholic and Protestant country, Hitler was only half atheist, right? Hitler hated Christianity, he hated the Christians and the Jews, he hated the Christian uh, philosophy of, of love, <laughs> he hated it, right? You know, it was, he, could, he didn't want his, he had to re-educate his, his people because, you know, forgiving your enemy is just, you know, it's, it's not part of what Hitler had in mind. So he had to deal with that philosophy, but according to the Chinese, he wasn't atheistic enough. Although Hitler also believed that ordinary citizens had low intelligence and that leaders should therefore make decisions, and although German people worshipped Hitler back then, Germany did not have the tradition of worshipping sages, i.e. wise men, on a broad basis. Our Chinese society has always worshipped sages, and that is because we don't worship any god. Once you worship a god, you can't worship a person at the same time. Well, they're quite right. Unless you recognize the person as the god's representative like they do in the Middle Eastern countries. What are they talking about? Muhammad. Yes. On the other hand, once you recognize a person as a sage, of course, you will want him to be your leader. Instead of monitoring and choosing him, this is the foundation of our democratic centralism. <laughs> democratic centralism. That, these two words don't really go together. So, so what the, this is why, you know, they, they worship the sage, they worship the wise person. In North Korea, they have the same thing. You worship the leader. And what this is why Xi Jinping and, and, and Mao, Zedong, uh, Mao, Mao Zedong, they had their little, he had his little red book, he had his, you know, his philosophy. And Xi Jinping, he has his thought, and his thought is, is, is published, but just like Hitler had his, his, his uh, Mein Kampf, his thought, right? And you're supposed to worship the sage, you're supposed to worship the man, not the God, not, not the God who created the universe and has love as his purpose in creating the universe. You are supposed to worship the figure, right? The bottom line is only China, not Germany, is a reliable force in resisting the Western Parliament-based democratic system. Hitler's dictatorship in Germany was perhaps but a momentary mistake in history. There you go. Hitler's, Hitler was just a, a momentary mistake in history. Well, it wasn't momentary for us, was it? Four years of hell. Millions, millions of people died 
on, on both sides of the war, the whole of Europe was utterly, totally destroyed. And according to the Chinese, oh, it was just a blip. That was just a momentary, you know, that was it. That was all. Hitler came and went. This man, what, what kind of man is this? Well, you'll see. You'll see more. This is just him. What about the others? Maybe now you have come to understand why we recently decided to further promulgate atheism. Promote atheism. Oh yes, atheism. If we let theology from the West into China and empty us from the inside, if we let all Chinese people listen to God and follow God, who will obediently listen to us and follow us? Yes. If the common people don't believe Comrade J Hu Jin Tao is qualified leader, question his authority and want to monitor him, if the religious followers in our society question why we are leading God in church, churches, can our party continue to rule China? Well, there, you see, this is it. For them, God is a threat. Religion, even Buddhism, I'm sure, is also a threat to them. All religion. But this is why they hate they hate God. Oof. Germany's dream to be the Lord of the Earth failed because ultimately history, history did not bestow this great mission upon them. So you see, they don't believe in God, but they believe there's some kind of will in, in, in history. And, and this is Chinese philosophy. It's, it's not even communism. I mean, they have this in communism, but in, 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 in communism that Marx developed, it was it was an evolutionary uh, destiny. It was it was a, it was a history was an evolutionary process. But the Chinese, uh, going back thousands of years, they they believe that there's some kind of will in history, and and uh, destiny. But they don't believe in God. It's it's kind of a it's a, it's a contradiction. Uh, but that's the case. They believe that history, history has some kind of will, and 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 Hitler was, it wasn't his destiny. But the three lessons Germany learned from experience are that we ought to remember as we complete our historic mission and revitalize our race. The three lessons are: firmly grasp the country's living space, firmly grasp the party's control over the nation and firmly grasp the general direction toward becoming the Lord of the Earth. Next, I'd like to address these three issues. The first issue is living space. This is the biggest focus of the revitalization of the Chinese race. In my last speech, I said that the fight over our basic living resources, including land and ocean, is that the source of the vast majority is the source of the vast majority of wars in history. Well, he's right. This may change in the information age, but not fundamentally. Our per capita resources are much less than those of Germany's back then. In addition, economic development in the last 20 years plus had a negative impact and climates are rapidly changing for the worse. Our resources are in short supply. The environment is severely polluted, especially of that of soil, water and air. Not only our ability to sustain and develop our race, but even its survival is gravely threatened to agree much greater than, than faced Germany back then. You see, they see their situation as a matter of survival. It's not, it's not a matter of, well, you know, we not only of being the lords of the earth, but it, that expansion is a necessity. Otherwise, they, you know, and, and you'll understand more. Anybody who has been to Western countries knows that their living space is much better than ours. They have forests alongside the highways, 
while we hardly have any trees by our streets. Their sky is often blue with white clouds, while our sky is covered with a layer of dark haze. Their tap water is clean enough for drinking, while even our groundwater is so polluted that it can't be drunk without filtering. They have few people in the streets, and two or three people can occupy a small residential building. In contrast, our streets are always crawling with people, and several people have to share one room. Many years ago, there was a book titled Yellow Catastrophes. It said that due to our following the American style of consumption, our limited resources will no longer support the population and society would collapse. Once our population reaches 1.3 billion, now our population has already exceeded this limit. But the term living space, Lebensraum, which is what the Germany is, what Hitler called it, Lebensraum, living space, and the, the Italian fascists called it, uh, uh, I forgot, something vitale, uh, oh, yes. Uh, something vital, vital living space. It was, it was uh, the, 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 the Italian fascists had a word for it, exactly the same as Hitler. And so it's the same philosophy. They, they, they've gone from communism to fascism. This is racism of the purest and, and uh, of greatest kind. You've not, never seen anything like it. They are fascists now, the Chinese Communist Party. Well, yes, they're communists, but they're fascist. But the term living space is too closely related to Nazi Germany. The reason we don't want to dis discuss this too openly is to avoid the West association of us with Nazi Germany, which could in turn reinforce the view that China is a threat. Therefore, our emphasis on human rights are just living rights. We only talk about living but not space, so as to avoid using the term living space. You see, it's all deception. From the perspective of history, the reason that China is faced with the issue of living space is because Western countries have developed ahead of, of Eastern countries. Western countries established colonies all around the world, therefore giving themselves an advantage on the issue of living space. To solve this problem, we must lead the Chinese people outside of China so that they could develop outside of China. Well, they're looking, they're looking at the situation. You, you can kind of see from their point of view, you know, the Western countries did. They went all over the world. Why shouldn't we? There's a, there's a logic to that, right? The second issue is our focus on the leadership capacity of the ruling party. Although the Nazis spread their power to every aspect of the German national government, they did not stress their absolute leadership position like we have. We have to focus on two points to fortify our leadership position and improve our leadership capacity. First is stressing that our party is the pioneer of the Chinese race. Many citizens say in private, we never voted for you, the Communist Party, to represent us? How can you claim to be our representatives? Well, obviously they know what people are thinking. There's no, there's no need to worry about this issue. As long as we can lead the Chinese people out of, outside of China, lead them out, right? Help them to expand. Resolving the lack of living space in China, the Chinese people will support us. Otherwise, basically, they, they not, the Chinese people are not interested in democracy. They, they just want the Chinese government to, to lead them, to give them what they need. We don't, we don't have to worry about the labels of totalitarianism or dictatorship. Whether we, can for, whether we can forever represent the Chinese people depends on whether we can succeed in leading the Chinese people out of China. They know that as long as China is expanding, as long as China is, is growing in power, the Chinese people will follow them. And that's true. We can see that. Yes, there are, uh, you know, dissidents, but the, the majority of the population, if, if, they, if, they've, 
if they've got a car, they've got an apartment, and they can send their kids to school and they can buy things, they don't care, they don't need anything more. They want stability. That's all they want. The second point, whether we can lead the Chinese people out of China, is the most important determinant of the Chinese Communist Party's leadership position. Why do I say this? Everyone knows that without the leadership of our party, China would not exist today. Therefore, our highest principle is to forever protect our party's leadership position. There's not going to be democracy in China. They're not changing. They're not becoming more, de more democratic as they grow wealthier. They're not going to follow our model. Never. We realized vaguely that as long as China's economy is developed, people would support and love the Communist Party. Therefore, we had to use several decades of peacetime to develop China's economy, and that's what they've done. No matter what isms, whether it's a white cat or a black cat, it, it is a good cat. It can develop China's economy. But we did not have mature ideas about how China would deal with international disputes after its economy has developed. Yeah, so they were focused on developing their economy, but, you know, where next? Comrade Xiaoping said that the main themes in the world were peace and development. But Tiananmen Square, remember Tiananmen Square, gave our party a warning and gave us a lesson that is still fresh. The pressure of China's peaceful evolution makes us reconsider the main themes of our time. We see that neither of these two issues, peace and development, has been resolved. The Western oppositional forces always change the world according to their own visions. They want to change China and use peaceful evolution to overturn the leadership of the Communist Party. Well, they're right. They're right. You know, the Western leadership, we always think, well, you know, if, if, if they develop economically, the people will change, they'll want democracy, and then the Chinese Communist Party will be overturned. That's how we think. And they know that's how we think. They're not stupid. Therefore, if we only develop the economy, we will still face the possibility of losing control. Right? That June the 4th riot, and that's Tiananmen Square, almost succeeded in bringing a peaceful transition. Yes, there was almost a revolution. If it were not for the fact that a large number of veteran comrades were still alive at a crucial moment, they removed Zhao Zhang and his followers. I guess that was the leader of the, 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 the protest. Then we all would have been, then we all would have been put in prison. So they, you know, they, they allowed the protests in, in Tiananmen Square went on for a long time. And then at one point, somewhere they're all, the old boys came in and said, we're not having this. They don't mind killing people. They killed, during the times of the revolution, they killed millions of people. And the old boys, they came in and said, right, we're going to win. And they just went in and slaughtered people in Tiananmen Square. And that was it, end of revolution. Otherwise, as he says, if, if, if the, the revolution has succeeded, we, will all, we would have all been put in prison. Oh. So they, uh, he says here, although we have passed the test of June the 4th, i.e. Tiananmen Square, passed the test, after our group of senior comrades pass away without our control, peaceful evolution may still come to China, like it did to the former Soviet Union. So, they don't want change. They don't want what happened to, you know, communist Russia. They don't want that to happen to them. That would be a, a disaster. After the food, June the 4th riot was suppressed, we have been thinking about how to prevent China from peaceful evolution and how to maintain the Communist Party's leadership. We thought it over and over, but did not come up with any good ideas. If we do not have good ideas, 
China will inevitably change peacefully and we will all become criminals in history. <laughs> you see, you see how evil all these people are? They know how bad they are. They know that if there's a peaceful change in China, they will go down in history as criminals. They know who they are. After some deep pondering, you can see them. You can't. You see them. You see them huddling, having meetings, Communist Party meetings, comrades. Well, comrade, how are we going to sustain our power? How are we going to stay in power over the people without going to prison? Because, because, because they know we're gangsters and criminals. We've killed how many people? Have you? How many people have you killed, comrade? Oh, I don't know. I've lost count. After some deep pondering, we finally came to this conclusion. Only by turning our developed national strength into the force of a fist, striking outwards, only by leading people to go out, can we win forever the Chinese people's support and love for the Communist Party. Whoa. Only by expanding can the people stay in love with the Chinese Communist Party. Our party will then stand on invincible ground and the Chinese people will have to depend on the Communist Party. They will forever follow the Communist Party with their hearts and minds. Therefore, the June the 4th riot, Tiananmen Square, made us realize that we must combine economic development with preparation for war and leading the people to go out. Therefore, since then, our national defence policy has taken a 180 degree turn and we have since emphasised more and more combining peace and war. Our economic development is all about preparing for the need for war. Publicly, we will emphasise economic development as, as our centre but in reality, economic development has war as its centre. So the more China develops economically, the closer we are to war with China. Right? China is coming for us. This is not, oh, maybe, oh, let's, let's keep, get this character in a several peaceful world. China is coming for us. They want to kill us in order for them to survive. We have made a tremendous effort to construct the Great Wall project to build up along our coastal and land frontiers as well as around large and medium sized cities a solid underground Great Wall that can withstand a nuclear war. They've been building bunkers and God knows what, they're getting ready for war, their whole nation. That's what China is. It's a massive project for war and nothing else. We are also storing all necessary war materials. Therefore, we will not hesitate to fight a third world war. So as to lead the people to go out and to ensure the party's leadership position in any event, we, the Chinese Communist Party, will never step down from the stage of history. We'd rather have the whole world, or even the entire globe, share life and death with us, than step down from the stage of history. This is the Chinese Communist Party. This is Mr. Xi Jinping. He looks like a teddy bear. But the man is the head of the most unbelievable. These people are hard as nails. They don't want peace. Isn't there a nuclear bondage theory? It means that since nuclear weapons have bound the security of the entire world, all will die together if death is inevitable. In my view, there is another kind of bondage and that is the fate of our party is tied up with that of the whole world and if we the Chinese Communist Party are finished 
China will be finished and the world will be finished. They're going to, you know, they're, they're going to take the whole world down with them. If they go down, the world goes down. They're going to grab the whole world. This is the plan. And if the world resists them, then we're all going to go down with them, fighting. Do you understand what we're dealing with? Our party's historical mission is to lead the Chinese people to go out. If we take the long view, we will see that history led us on this path. First, China's long history has resulted in the world's largest population, including Chinese in China, as well as overseas. Second, once we open our doors, the profit-seeking Western capitalists will invest capital and technology in China to assist our development so that they can occupy the biggest market in the world. They know, they know that capitalists are greedy, that, the, that all they need to do is open their doors a little bit and they'll come pouring in to get some bucks and then they will invest their technology in China and China will develop the, the, the means by which to wage war. Third, our numerous overseas Chinese help us create the most favourable environment for the introduction of foreign capital. Oh yes, foreign technology and advanced experience into China. Because they're useless themselves. They're just a bunch of gangsters, the Chinese Communist Party. They're just like mafia, they're idiots. They've got no brains, they're just tough bastards. Thus, it is guaranteed that our reform an open door policy will achieve tremendous success. So, yes, they opened up and the whole world thought, yay, Chinese are opening up, let's make some money. But these, they, they, these people, are, they're, they're cunning. They, they, they understand them. They're psychologically, they, they're smart in that way. Fourth, China's great economic expansion will inevitably lead to the shrinking shrinking of per capita living space for the Chinese people and this will encourage China to turn outward in search of new living space. Well, yes, they, they understand that. Fourth, China, China's great economic expansion will inevitably come with a significant development in our military forces, creating conditions for our expansion overseas. Even since Napoleon's time, the West has been alert for the possible awakening of the sleeping lion that is China, or we call it the dragon. Now the sleeping lion is standing up and advancing into the world and has become unstoppable. Oh yes, comrades, we are unstoppable now. What is the third issue we should clinch firmly in order to accomplish our historical mission of national renaissance. It is to hold firmly onto the big issue of America. Oh, America. The big issue of America. Yes, now this is a problem for China. This appears to be shocking, but the logic is actually very simple. The Renaissance of China is in fundamental conflict with the Western strategic interest, interest and therefore will it inevitably be obstructed by the Western countries doing everything they can. So only by breaking the blockade formed by the Western countries headed by the United States can China grow and move towards the world. So the obstacle is the, is the United States. Would the United States allow us to go out to gain new living space? First, if the United States is firm in blocking us, it is hard for us to do anything significant to Taiwan and some other countries. Second, even if we could snatch some land from Taiwan, Vietnam, India, or even Japan, how much more living space can we get? Very trivial. Only countries like the United States, Canada and Australia have the vast land to serve our need for mass colonization. 
Let me read that to you again. Even if we could snatch some land from Taiwan, Vietnam, India, or even Japan, how much limit more living space can we get? Very trivial. Only countries like the United States, Canada, and Australia have the vast land to serve our, our, our mass need for colonization. They, they don't want to have a conflict or war with America. They want to colonize it. China wants to colonize America. Therefore, solving the issue of America is the key to solving all other issues. First, this makes it possible for us to have many people migrate there and even establish another China under the same leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. They see America as potential for another China. Now you might say that sounds ridiculous. How do you do that? I mean, you know, the Americans have got a lot of people and they're all in the hills with guns. How do you do that? They think they can do that. I mean, that's a shocking, you know, statement to make. Oh, we're going to colonize you, America. We're coming for you. We're going to take your land. America was originally discovered by the ancestors of the yellow race, but Columbus gave credit to the white race. We, the descendants of the Chinese nation, are entitled to the possession of the land. It is said that the residents of the yellow race have a very low social status in the United States, talking about the American Indians, right? They consider them, the American Indians, their ancestors, and they've been treated badly. And therefore they have, they have a sense of injustice, the Chinese. We need to liberate them. We need to liberate them. The Chinese are coming to liberate the American, what we call the American Indians. Well, they consider them the American Chinese or the Native Americans. They don't call them Indians anymore, Native Americans. have been treated badly and, and they have. And they want them, the Chinese are coming to liberate them. Watch out, America. Second, after solving this issue of America, the Western countries in Europe would bow to us not to mention Taiwan, Japan and other small countries. Therefore, solving the issue of America is the mission assigned to the Chinese Communist Party members by history. This is their historical mission, is to solve the issue of America. And this is, America is just a problem to solve. How do we deal with it? How do we get rid of the, the population and take the land? I sometimes think how cruel it is for China and the United States to be enemies that are bound to meet on a narrow road. There is a famous remark in a movie that is full of power and grandeur. The enemies are bound to meet on a narrow road. Only the brave will win. It is this kind of fighting to win or die spirit that enabled us to seize power in mainland China. Yes. Under Chairman Mao, small band of, of followers, you know, eventually uh, took over the forces that occupied, or, you know, the, the nationalist forces that occupied China. They were brave, they were strong, they were committed, and they went through hardship, and they, they eventually took power. And this is the spirit that they, they think they should have when dealing with America. It's an absolute spirit. First, uh, first, this makes it possible to have many people migrate there and even establish another child. Oh, I said that. Uh, yes, liberate them. Second, after solving the issue of America, the Western countries in Europe would... Oh, yes, they've done that done that. Uh, it is historical destiny that China and the United States will come into unavoidable confrontation 
on a narrow path and fight each other. War is unavoidable. The United States, unlike Russia and Japan, has never occupied and hurt China. And also, sorry, the United States, unlike Russia and Japan, has never occupied and hurt China and also assisted China in its battle against the Japanese. Yes, that's true. But, but, it will certainly be an obstruction and the biggest obstruction and the biggest obstruction in the long run the relationship of China and the United States is one of a life and death struggle let that sink in let that sink in so actually China did now America did help China you know fight against the Japanese uh, and uh, I mean, the, the, in the Korean War, Ch uh, American troops and, and Chinese troops came into into conflict over Korea, but but the Americans never attacked China itself. One time, some Americans came to visit and tried to convince us that the relationship between between China and the United States is one of interdependence. Comrade Xiao Ping, who was who at that time was, was, you know, the top leader in China, replied in a polite manner, go tell your government, China and the United States do not have such a relationship that is interdependent and mutually reliant. So basically he told them to F off. Actually, Comrade Zhao Ping was being too polite. He could have been more frank the relationship between China and the United States is one of a life and death struggle. So this was in 2005, 15 years ago. Uh, do, you, do you think that they've changed in 15 years? Do you think they've suddenly changed? Chinese are not like that. Chinese think ahead, they plan. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, even 100 years, they have a sense of continuity and discipline, and they will plan ahead. So China believes that they are headed for a confrontation with America, that it's absolutely inevitable, and that it's a life and death struggle. Oh, right, so it's a life and death struggle, of course. Right now, it is not the time to openly break up with them, yet. Our reform and opening to the outside world will still rely on their capital and technology. What a bunch of thieves! We, was, we still need America. Therefore, we must do everything we can to promote our relationship with America learn from America in all aspects and use America as an example to reconstruct our culture. So these people believe that they're superior, that they're the superior race, yet at the same time they have to get everything from someone else. I mean, what a bunch of gangsters, honestly. The United States is the most successful country in the world today. Only after we have learned all its useful experiences can we replace it in the future. <laughs> Even though they're like, they're, they are like a virus. They'll come in and, you know, take everything, suck all, everything out of you and then, then take you over. Even though we are presently imitating the American tone, China and United States rely on each other and share honour and disgrace. We must not forget that the history of our civilization repeatedly has taught us that one mountain does not allow two tigers to live together. That's quite a poetic thing. One mountain does not allow two tigers to live together. This town ain't big enough for the two of us. The hidden message is we must put up with America we must conceal our ultimate goals, hide our capabilities, 
and await the opportunity. Thus, we will understand why we constantly talk loudly about the Taiwan issue, but not the American issue. We all know the principle of doing one thing under the cover of another. If ordinary people can only see the small island of Taiwan in their eyes, then you, as the elite of our country, should be able to see the whole picture of our cause. So, so this is the thing. They're always talking about Taiwan, make everyone think that they're trying to get Taiwan, which they are, of course, but that's all a cover for their main goal, which is to get America. So there you go, look at that. In history, when a country defeated another country or occupied another country, it could not kill all the people in the conquered land. Because back then, you could not kill people effectively with sabres or long spears or even with rifles or machine guns. Therefore, it was impossible to gain a stretch of land without keeping the people on that land. However, if we conquered America in this fashion, we would not be able to make many people migrate there, right? So if they didn't kill all the people in America, not many Chinese would, would kind of want to go there. They've got to get rid of everyone. Only by using special means to clean up America will we be able to lead the Chinese people there. This is the only choice left to us. This is not a matter of whether we are willing to do it or not. This is the only choice to kill all the Americans, right? This is the goal, to kill every American, get rid of them, clean it out. This is what they're thinking, this is how they think. What kind of special means is there available for us to clean up America? Conventional weapons such as fighters, cannons, missiles and nuclear weapons, battleships won't do. Neither will highly destructive weapons such as nuclear weapons. We are not as foolish as to want to perish together with America by using nuclear weapons, despite the fact that we have been exclaiming that we will have the Taiwan issue resolved at whatever cost. So what they're saying is if you if you mess with Taiwan, we'll throw we nuclear weapons at you. But actually, that's, you know, that's not really going to happen. That's just a, a you know, ploy. Only by using non-destructive weapons that can kill many people will be able to reserve America for ourselves. Non-destructive weapons. Only by using non-destructive weapons that can kill many people will we be able to reserve America for ourselves. What kind of weapons can you have that don't destroy the environment? Hmm, I wonder what that can be. There has been rapid development of modern biological technology. And new bioweapons that have been invented one after another. Of course, we have not been idle in the past years. We have seized the opportunity to master weapons of this kind. We are capable of achieving our purpose of cleaning up America all of a sudden. They, they've gained the technology apparently in 2005. Well, I don't think so, but they think that that's what they're telling their people. When, or they might have got something from the Russians at that time, possibly. I don't think they've got anything by, from America in 2005. They might have. Remember, they don't develop their own technology, they get it from elsewhere. When Comrade Xiaoping was still with us, the party central committee had the perspicacity to make the right decision not to develop aircraft carrier groups and focus instead on developing lethal weapons that can eliminate mass populations of the enemy country. So this is why Yes, this is why, you know, they still actually don't have lots of aircraft carriers and, uh, and massive amounts of, of fighter jets and bombers and so on. 
they have more now than they did. But I think they only have one aircraft carrier. That's, you know, for a massive nation that size, they should have a much bigger navy. But in fact, that's because back then they made the decision to focus on biological weapons first. From a, which is, in a way, kind of good for us. Well, it's not good, but the fact that they don't have a massive army, a massive, you know, infrastructure like Navy and so on, means that, that America is still stronger from that point of view. From a humanitarian perspective, we should issue a warning to the American people and persuade them to leave America and leave the land they have lived in leave the land they have lived in to the Chinese people, right? They should give them a warning, leave. Or at least they, or at least they should leave half of the United States to be China's colony. Because America was first discovered by the Chinese. But would this work? If, if this strategy does not work, then there is only one choice left to us, that is use decisive means to clean up America and reserve America for our use in a moment. Whoa. Americans, are you listening? If you've got any Americans watching this, this is what you're dealing with. Biological weapons to clean you out, clean you out, that's it. They don't want to have a fight with you for, you know, to be who to be the most powerful country in the world. That's not what this is about. They want your land. Colonize it. They want your land to live in. Our historical experience has proven that as long as we make it happen, nobody in the world can do anything about us. Furthermore, if the United States as the leader is gone, then other enemies have to surrender to us. Biological weapons are unprecedented in their ruthlessness. But if the Americans do not die, then the Chinese have to die. If the Chinese people are strapped to the present land, a total societal collapse is bound to take place. According to computation, more than half of the Chinese will die. And that figure would be more than 800 million people. Just after the liberation, our yellow land supported nearly 500 million, while today the official figure of the population is more than 1.3 billion. This, uh, and, and now it's more, this yellow land has reached the limit of its capacity. One day, who knows how soon it will come, the great collapse will occur any time and more than half of the population will have to go. We must prepare ourselves for two scenarios. If our biological weapons succeed in the surprise attack on the United States, the Chinese people will be able to keep their losses at a minimum in the fight against the United States. If, however, the attack fails and triggers a nuclear ret retaliation from the United States, China would perhaps suffer a catastrophe in which more than half of its population would perish. That is why we need to be ready with air defense systems for our big and medium-sized cities. Whatever the case may be, we can only move forward fearlessly for the sake of our party and state and our nation's future, regardless of the hardships we have to face and the sacrifices we have to make. The population, even if more than half dies, can be reproduced. But if the party fails, everything is gone and forever gone. So, you know, they're ready to willing, they're, they're willing to come into conflict with America and lose half their population because they know it can be replaced. This is how they think. They are, they consider human beings basically just like, like animals, like, like farms. It's just a farm for them. The population is a farm, but it's the party is the central thing. It's the most important thing. If the party survives, the nation will survive. In Chinese history, in the replacement of dynasties, the ruthless have always won, 
and the benevolent have always failed. That's the history, the ruthless. So they're like a dynasty. Therefore, we must emphasize the importance of adopting resolute measures. In the future, the two rivals, China and the United States, will eventually meet each other on a narrow road, and our leniency to the American, Americans will mean cruelty towards the Chinese people. It is indeed brutal to kill one or two hundred million Americans, but that is the only path that will secure a Chinese century, a century in which the Chinese Communist Party leads the world. Ha ha ha! The Chinese Communist Party will lead the world. This is like a James Bond movie. They're sitting there and, and they, the Chinese Communist Party, a little group of people, right? Their plan is to lead the world and they're absolute in that plan. We, as revolutionary humanitarians, humanitarians, yeah, we, as, listen to this, we as revolutionary humanitarians do not want deaths. But if history confronts us with a choice between the deaths of Chinese and those of Americans, we'd have to pick the latter. As for us, it is more important to safeguard the life, lives of Chinese people and the life of our party. That is because, after all, we are Chinese and members of the Chinese Communist Party. So, you know, we don't really want to kill people, but if, we, if there's no choice, you know, we'll just have to do it. These people have no humanity whatsoever. It's also them, basically. This is not about you know, living in China and controlling the world from China. This is about absolute power over the world. Since the, jo the day we joined the Communist Party, the party's life has always been above all else. History will prove that we made the right choice. The Chinese Communist Party is above all else. Absolute dedication to the Chinese Communist Party. They will rule. Simply put, through conducting this online service, survey, we wanted to know whether, whether the people would rise against us if one day we secretly adopt resolute means to clean up America. Would more people support us or oppose us? This is our basic judgment. If our people approve of shooting at prisoners of war, women and children, then they would approve of cleaning up America. Yes, you know, we've basically brainwashed the population that the Americans are the enemy. And, and you know, unfortunately, it's, it's us or them, and, and we just have to clean them out. For over 20 years, China has been enjoying peace, and a whole generation has not been tested by war. In particular, since the end of World War II, there have been many changes in the formats of war, the concept of war, and the ethics of war, especially since the collapse of the former Soviet Union and Eastern European communist states, the ideology of the West has come to dominate the world as a whole, and the Western theory of human nature and Western view of human rights have increasingly disseminated among the young people in China. Therefore, we were not very sure about the people's attitude, if our people are fundamentally opposed to cleaning up America, we will, of course, have to adopt corresponding methods. Well, measures. Corresponding measures. So if the people are not, you know, if the people are not with us, we will have to adopt corresponding measures. I hate to think what that means, corresponding measures. We're nearly there. What turned out to be very comforting is that they did not turn in a blank test paper. In fact, they turned in a test paper with a score of over 80. This is excellent fruition of our party's work in propaganda and education over the last few decades. So basically, they have brainwashed the, the, the Chinese population to be harsh, to be, to be cruel, to just, you know, they do not think in the same way as we do. 
unfortunately, we, you know, you, you know, many young Chinese people studying in, in Western universities, and, and we assume that, you know, and they, they come and they see how we are and see how we behave. And, and they have a mixed, uh, they have a mixed perspective on that. Uh, I know because, you know, my son went to university and, and, uh, and there were many Chinese at that university, but they, they always stuck to themselves. They always had their own group. They didn't mix. Uh, and, and they, and, and, and this is because they're afraid. They're afraid of the Westerners uh, and they, they, they just, well, they've, they've basically been, from a young age, they've been educated to, to, to not like us. Even if they're polite and, and, and kind, of course they're not all that way, but that is unfortunately the reality. Uh, of course, a few people under the Western influence have objected to shooting at prisoners of war and women and children. Although there are not too many people holding this kind of viewpoint and they will not affect the overall situation in any significant way. But we still need to strengthen the propaganda to respond to this kind of argument. So since 2005, they've, they've been expanding their propaganda program, apparently. You will find out that a while ago, the US has a shocking conspiracy. Now, here, this is something very interesting. From September the 27th to October the 1st in 1995, Mikhail Sergov uh, Gorbachev Foundation, funded by the United States, gathered 500 of the world's most important statesmen, economic leaders, and scientists, including, now, this is so interesting, including George W. Bush, though he was not president at that time, the Baroness Thatcher, Tony Blair, I can't pronounce this name, Zygmunt Brezhnevsky, as well as George Soros, Bill Gates, futurist, John Nasbitt, I don't know, etc. All of the world's most popular characters in San Francisco Fairmont Hotel for a high-level roundtable conference discussing problems about globalization and how to guide humanity to move forward to the 21st century. Accordingly, the people in attendance thought that in the 21st century, a mere 20% of the world's population will be sufficient to maintain the world's economy and prosperity. The other 80% or four-fifths of the world population will be human garbage, unable to produce new values. The people in attendance thought that this excess 80% population would be a trash population and high-tech means should be used to eliminate them gradually. Now this is very, very interesting because, of course, we, we know about the globalism, the globalists and so on. Well, it looks like this was a kind of round table of globalists and I, I didn't know about this. Uh, some, some of you may know. And that there's this plot to basically eliminate 80% of the population, right? So, and who happened to be there? I mean, they may not all have had that, that agenda, but, 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 you know, uh, uh, Bill Gates, George Soros were there, right? And, 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 and uh, so, so what we have now, and, and this is what through, through the last six and a half weeks of research, this is what I've, the conclusion that I've come to is that there are two, basically two, threats that are facing us, that will want to destroy us, right? There is the Chinese Communist Party who want to destroy us, and then there are the, the globalist nutters, basically, uh, the, the, the eugenicists, the Bill Gates, right? And the George Soroses who, so, so what we're, we're facing, we've got 
two sets of people who basically want to eliminate us. You've got the globalists, right? The cabal and, and, the, and the one world government who want to, to eliminate 80% of the population. And then you've got the Chinese Communist Party who want to clean out the world so that their population, the superior race, uh, can have their living space. So now, this is, uh, this is, and this is what we're experiencing today. This is not, you know, our governments, I don't know what's happened to our guys. I think they've been, they've been kidnapped or something because they're, they're behaving very, very strangely. And we all know there's strange things going on. So, but then we have to consider this point. If there are two groups of people with trying to achieve the same aim, they may have allied themselves together or, they, or not. Certainly I know that Bill Gates it has very high uh, connections in the Chinese Communist Party. So perhaps or almost certainly they've done a deal. You know, well, well, I'll help you clean out the world population so you can move in. As long as I've got a nice job or a nice position, right? I mean, this must be what's going on. Because Bill Gates, his, uh, um, Bill Gates and, and, and whatever his, what her name is, Melinda or something, Gates Foundation operates in China has been operating in China for a long time and he, he moves, they think he's some kind of god and he moves up in the high echelons of, of the Chinese Communist Party, you see? So this is, but then when we, when we think about it at the end of the day, these two groups of people, in the end they don't have the same agenda. And we know that the Chinese Communists are superior, they consider themselves the superior race. So what do they think of, in the end, Bill Gates is going to be toast. Communists just don't like people with glasses. So, you know, we have to consider that, that there may well be a clash and that might work in our favour. And so, I will just finish off. Uh, what he has to say uh, and so this is how he sees it he sees oh well and of course this was in, in 2005 since the enemies are secretly planning to eliminate our population so so this is back then there, there was little connection between Bill Gates wasn't in China then since I don't think anyway since the enemies are secretly planning to eliminate our population, we certainly cannot be infinitely merciful and compassionate to them. It has proven the correctness of our tit-for-tat battle approach. So the Chinese see that the, the, the West, the capitalists or the, whoever these people are, want to eliminate them. So they have a perfect right to, to take the stance that they have. Certainly, we cannot publish in the party newspapers. Well, they can't publish this policy, otherwise everyone will find out. In order to avoid raising the enemy's vigilance and remind the enemy that we have grasped the modern science and technology, including clean nuclear technology, gene weapons technology, as well as biological weapons. I thought that was the same. Uh, technology. And we can use powerful measures to eliminate their population on a large scale. The last problem I want to talk about is of firmly, firmly seizing the preparation for military battle. Currently we are at the crossroad of moving forward or backward. After resolving the domestic problems, we can then deal with the foreign military battle problems. The Central Committee believes as long as we resolve the United States problem at one blow, 
our domestic problems will all be readily solved. Therefore, our military battle preparation appears to aim at Taiwan, but in fact it is aimed at the United States. And the preparation is far beyond the scope of attacking aircraft carriers or satellites. As war approaches, I am full of hope for our next generation. So that was the stance of the, of the Chinese Communist Party in 2005. And I think it's very unlikely that it's changed in the last 15 years. So if we look at what's going on in America at this time, we can see that they are in fact uh, carrying out this agenda. But this is a complicated issue because, in my opinion, they are not in charge of the agenda. The, the agenda ran away from them because in, in, in something unexpected happened in uh, 2016. In fact, two things unexpected things happened in 2016, and that was Donald Trump got elected and Britain left the EU. These, uh, these two things were a shock. They actually upset the whole plan of China and the globalists too, because Donald Trump is not a globalist. He's a New Yorker, he's a hustler, and he, his values even though he's, you know, a bit rough around the edges, but his, his inner self is, is Christian, his family, uh, he, he, you know, he's, he's from Scotland, he's from Scotland, he's an Anglophile, even though, I mean, you know, the United Kingdom. His, his family were very strict Christians, so he has got the Christian spirit. He believes in the Second Amendment. He's not going to let the Americans be disarmed. Uh, and that's a problem for the Chinese. The Chinese expected that Hillary Clinton would win and have at least two terms. And the whole agenda was to disarm the American population through uh, um, gun control. And so the Chinese, I believe, is my belief, uh, had a plan that would they would they wouldn't execute this plan of mass murder of the of the uh, American people for at least another eight years uh, from uh, you know to 2016 and because the Chinese basically own uh, the the uh, the Democrat Party they are deeply deeply infiltrated and they are deeply connected with the Chinese Communist Party and uh, they, they, they stand for China, and if you, uh, for example, we have Diane Fan Feinstein. Diane Feinstein is, is a Democrat um, senator, and she's had a 30-year relationship uh, with China. She, she, I mean, she's been deep in the, in the Chinese pocket and uh, she's advocated for China and, and it was a lot of her work that, that brought China into the, the world economy and helped them to, to uh, start uh, growing their economy. She's a traitor, she's a traitorous dog and she's, she, she's an enemy of the American people. She's, she's, she's allowed uh, the Democrat party to just become, I mean, it's, obvious, it's not just her, I mean, all of them, they're all doing business in China, they're all in the pocket of the Chinese, so the Chinese exert influence on them about uh, policy, political policy in, in America. And of course, the, 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 uh, because of, of eight years of Obama, uh, and having a, 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 a globalist president before them, the, the deep state, I mean, you know, what would be the equivalent for us would be the, 
would be the, the civil service, but we call them, you know, what goes on in America as the deep state. It's security services, it's all of its homeland services have just completely, completely infiltrated. And so it's a horn, it's, 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 a, it's a den of vipers. And, and it's, it's the, the control that the Chinese have in America. And, and then, of course, the Democrat governors in America are very powerful people. They, they're like little kings in the, in, you know, of their state. They're like presidents of their state. I mean, they, they preside over a population the size of, 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 of Britain. So they're, like, they're as powerful as our prime minister. And, and they, uh, they, the Democrats, they are actually executing right now uh, the, Com the Chinese Communist Party um, agenda. They, they are suspending the civil rights of, of Americans, they're, they're controlling the churches um, and passing legislation which goes absolutely against the, uh, the, the constitution of Americans and Americans are shocked. And they're coming out on the street and then, then the, the police are coming out and arresting them just for, for coming out on the street. It's almost like, like Hong Kong now in America. It's a shocking situation. The, the Chinese are right now trying to take over America. That is exactly what is happening. And actually that's what's happening here in a different way. So, but America is the target. America is the first target, as you know from this. If they fall, then we, we, we will capitulate as well. So, they, but they had to move early and the globalists had to move early. They weren't ready for it because Donald Trump came in and upset the apple cart. As he, took, he said to China, we're not going to accept your economic uh, system. We're, we're going to, re we're going to re rejig our, our economic relationship and make it equal. And this was not good for the Chinese. Uh, they had a two-year trade war. In the end, the Chinese lost. They had to sign an agreement. But within the agreement was, was a get-out clause. And the get-out clause was if there is some kind of what they call in insurance terms an act of God, like some kind of big disaster, then they, they weren't bound by this agreement. And guess what? There was a virus. Oh yes, how convenient that the Chinese are no longer bound by this agreement and they're ready for war. But they're actually not ready for war because they weren't expecting it for at least another eight years. And Donald Trump is trying to control the situation without America falling apart and without it becoming a police state in, within the states. And, and that's what's happening right now. And if you watch what's going on in America, because what goes on in America decides what happens here. So, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a, lot to, a lot to share. It's a massive situation. But I wanted to share uh, this speech because that tells you what's happening right now on a global level. And, and of course the issue of, of Bill Gates, you know, is a whole other ball game and the vaccines and, and, the, and, the, and the G5, I don't really understand that. Uh, but we know it's all interlinked. So what are these people doing? They're trying to cull us, right? We are being culled. They're setting us up for the cull. They want to get rid of us, right? So we have to decide, are we going to stand up or are we going to just allow ourselves to be culled? And this is, this is um, you know, this is where we're at right now. So that's all I have to say for today. Thank you very much. This is Brexit Mapman, over and out.